Hello and welcome everyone to the next installment in our year-long series on Sachajit Ray as part of the lecture and film uh, series that's been going on for many a year now. Uh, before we kick things off, I just want to uh, give a word to our sponsors, uh, the Adikus Funds, the Verein der Freunde und Förderer der Goethe-Universität and the Hessische Film und Medien Academy. Without their generous support, this series would be impossible. Um, but right now, I want to introduce our speaker tonight, who will be introducing the film Aparajitu uh, by Satyajit Ray from 1956, the second installment of the uh, Apu trilogy, albeit, for those who have been following uh, this series assiduously, the third one we will encounter, we've kind of done it a little bit out of order, starting with uh, Pata Panchali right at the start of the series uh, uh, back in October. Uh, and... Uh, zipping forward to the world of Apu. Uh, now we get the kind of second installment in the trilogy with Aparajita. Uh, but a few words on Manashita. Uh, she is presently a reader in film and media studies at the Royal Holloway University of London, uh, having gained her PhD uh, from Stanford University and also serving as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Manashita's research focuses on South Asian media and cultural history, uh, in particular Bengali and Hindi cinema, uh, as well as the Geopolitically, geopolitical imaginary of film and modernist studies. Uh, she's already um, put out a few books which are well worth uh, looking into for anyone interested in this kind of basic field. Uh, her first book was Outside the Lettered City, Cinema, Modernity and the Public Sphere in Colonial India, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. Uh, and more recently, she uh, put out a contribution to the uh, world-renowned BFI Classics series on Ritvik Gattak's The Cloud Cab Star. So that is definitely uh, worth checking out because that's, uh, I mean, both the film and the book. Uh, the film you can actually check out in two weeks' time uh, at six o'clock before our next uh, lecture and film series. So we get a kind of Gattak Ray double bill uh, in two weeks' time. And you can read uh, Manashita's uh, monograph on the film in preparation for that. Uh, at moment, at the moment, uh, Manashita though is at work on a new project, provisionally entitled "Left Luggage: Cinematic Legacies of the Indian People's Theatre Association," which will look uh, at that organisation in particular, but also more broadly at the impact of left-wing radicalism on the film cultures of Bombay and Calcutta in the 1940s and 60s. Uh, but of course, tonight she's here to talk to us about Aparajita. Uh, so. Right now, I'll welcome Manashita onto the lectern. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking Dr. Koshik, Professor Hedegar, and Professor Fairfax, and the DFF, of course, for organizing this wonderful series and for inviting me to be part of it. I'm very happy to be um, very happy to be here to introduce a film that has always affected me deeply, although in different ways at different points in my life. I've had a very, my relationship with the film has evolved over time and I, I, um, I'm going to talk about that after the screening. But um, I just wanted to get a sense of how many of you have already seen the film, Operajita. Okay, well, not too many. So I'll try not to give away too much while I provide some contextual information make some, make a few literary historical connections, um, suggest a couple of ways of thinking about the film and pose some questions, uh, which I look forward to exploring with you after the screening. So I'll try to keep my remarks uh, relatively brief and uh, get started now. And it's interesting that you're watching, I like the fact that you're watching it slightly out of sync, having seen Pathir Pacheli first and then the third film of the trilogy, and now the second connecting one, um, because that would make for an interesting viewing experience. I look forward to hearing about that after the screening as well. Um, Operatita is perhaps the least discussed film of the trilogy, even though it had staunch champions in um, Ghatak's fellow filmmakers, Mrinal Shen and Vitti Ghatak, um, sorry, Ray's uh, um, fellow filmmakers, Mrinal Shen and Vitti Ghatak, um, and it won a Golden Lion at the 1957 Venice Film Festival. And Ray himself felt, and I quote, that um, it was a more mature and satisfying film than Pothir Pachali for him. But um, 
Ironically enough, he also realized that what he saw as the core strength of the film might have contributed to uh, the initial mixed the film's initial uh, mixed reception by the Bengali audience, which he always saw as his primary audience. Um, uh, unlike most of uh, um, Shotujit Rai's films, Oporajito had a somewhat disappointing initial run when it was first released in Calcutta. Um, before I go on to talk more, just uh, a gloss on how I'm pronouncing the Bengali names and surnames. So I'll go back and forth between Satyajit Ray, which is how he would be referred to in um, most of India, outside of Bengal, and Shotujit Rai, which is how Bengalis would um, pronounce it, um, just as I will go back and forth between Mrinal Sen and Mrinal Shen, Ritik Ghatak and Ritik Ghatok, and also Opu and Apu. So just wanted to mention that. Now, Oporajito is um, usually billed as a coming-of-age story, but it's a coming-of-age story with a difference. And what makes it different is its dual perspective, which is reflected even in the posters uh, that, were, that you see on the screen that were released, uh, that were um, um, part of the promotional campaign before the film was released in Calcutta um, in 1957, late 1956, I think, and uh, in the US. So on one level, it's, um, oops, sorry. On one level, it's a story of the young Opu um, growing up in Varanasi or Benares, and then in Bengal in the 1920s and the 1930s, um, learning and dreaming about the world, making his way into the world, eventually moving from the village to the city to study on a scholarship. But on another level, it's the, also the story of Shorbuja, his mother, who enables him to make this journey, but is inevitably left behind. And so, um, when it came out, one American reviewer suggested that uh, um, it might have been, might just as well have been called the mother instead of the unvanquished. And I'm uh, curious to hear about what you think, whether you agree with him after you've seen the film. So um, one of the things that I find fascinating about the film is its intertwining of the two stories. And it's this intertwining that offers you more than one focal point. So what you see as the focal point, uh, especially in the second half of the film, depends on who you are, at what point in your life you see the film, what experiences you bring to um, the film. And what you see as the focal point can actually change in the, over, the course of, over the course of multiple viewings, over the course of your life. That's what happened with me. Um, that's true of many other films, but it's especially true with, for um, Oporajito, I feel. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the making, about how Ray came to the, make the film. Um, when he made Pothir Pachali, he hadn't really planned a sequel, let alone a trilogy. Uh, but the um, local and international success of Pothir Pachali emboldened um, Ray to think about giving up his day job in advertising and taking up filmmaking as a full-time profession, an idea that his mother was not very enamored of. More about that later. But in order to do that, in order to um, become a full-time filmmaker, he needed a second project and a producer for that project. And so he started reading a lot of Bengali stories and novels. Um, and in the course of that, process, he reread Oporajito, which was the um, sequel to Pothir Pachali, the Bengali novel that had inspired uh, Ray's first film and the first film of the Opu trilogy that he had adapted for his first film. So I want to pause a little bit here and, say, um, and, and talk a bit about the two novels for those of you who might not be familiar with them. So Pothir Pachali, which was first serialized in a leading Bengali periodical in 1929, and its sequel, Oporajito, which came out and which was published in 1932, constitute a sort of Bildungsroman set in the 20th century. Um, it traces the growth and education of Opu, a Bengali boy born into an upper caste but impoverished family in a remote village. His family then leaves the village and over a course of transplant, and after a series of transplantations, he eventually goes to Calcutta to study. The main focus is on Opu's expanding sense of the world and his place in it. But it's, it also, um, there's also in the two novels, 
a sense of a lost world, of a lost way of life, um, in its very loving and detailed evocation of rural Bengal. And I want to talk a bit about uh, Shotujit Rai's relationship to the novels. Unlike many other Bengali middle-class readers of his age, he actually didn't read them growing up. He um, said later in interviews that um, while he read quite a bit growing up, it was mainly nonfiction and English light fiction rather than Bengali. So he um, read Pothir Pachali and Opera Jitu, uh, in his 20s when he was working and in advertising and as an illustrator. And he was asked to do the illustrations for Amatir Bhepu, you see the cover um, designed by Ray um, on the left. And um, this was an abridged version of Pothe Pachali, meant for children. And that's when he read the two novels. And he was really struck by its evocation, which was both lyrical and encyclopedic, of a way of life that was quite unfamiliar with him. He had grown up in North and then South Calcutta and really had very little experience of rural life before he got, um, before he decided to. Uh, adapt Pothir Pachali for his first film. So when he was rereading Opera Jitu, he was really struck by a passage that describes Opu's state of mind right after he receives the news of his mother's death. In the novel, he receives a telegram telling him that his mother had passed away. And this is my translation of the passage um, that, had, uh, that Ray found really compelling. Um, it basically describes how Opu feels a fleeting sense of relief, almost a sense of liberation, right after reading the telegram, which is of course followed by a sense of horror. And he berates himself um, about how he could be so cruel and so heartless to even have this reaction. But try as he might, he couldn't wish away the reality of his instinctive first response to the news of his mother's death. Now, Shrotujit Rai uh, found this passage particularly compelling. In fact, Onil Choudhury, um, one of his close associates and who worked as a production manager on his early films, um, writes about visiting Ray in his office. He still hadn't given up his day job. And um, Ray was very excited and told him that I think I've just found the emotional kernel of my second film in this passage. And he uh, speaks about this in multiple interviews in his own writings as the mainspring of the sp a screenplay he wrote, what he saw as the razor death throw of the film. Now, the scene itself doesn't appear, uh, but it suggests the narrative and emotional arc that uh, Satyajit Ray would trace, especially in the second half of the film. And um, as you can probably imagine, uh, this, the depiction of the mother-son relationship in Opera Jitu is quite different from mainstream depictions of that relationship, which um, would involve, which would be much more sentimental um, in its glorification of motherhood, uh, maternal sacrifice, filial piety, um, and much less, uh, there was not much room for mixed feelings there. In, uh, so it was all sweetness and devotion and sacrifice on the part of the mother. So, um, but that's the story that Ray is really interested in telling, even though he doesn't get to it till the second half of the film. As you'll see, the film falls into two different halves with two rather different structures. The first half is much more episodic, like Pothe Pacheli, while the, second, the first half um, is mostly set in Banaras, um, where uh, Opus family moves uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the place where Opus family moves uh, from Nishchindipur, where his um, you know, and where um, we see the young Opu played by Pinaki Shen Gupto. And then the second half of the film moves um, Opu and his mother to rural Bengal, um, and then Opu to Calcutta. And Shoran Koshal plays the adolescent Opu in the second half, which has a much more linear structure, uh, closer in that sense to Opu Shongshar. So Ray always thought that he felt that the three films constituted one single film. And so you can see the midpoint in Opera Jitu as sort of the midpoint of the trilogy, the transition point in the film. So um, 
Now, that passage and the mother-son relationship that the passage suggested to Ray had a personal resonance for him, as he mentioned in several interviews, uh, which was quite striking, uh, especially given Ray's famous emotional reticence and reserve. He was quite forthcoming when people asked him about autobiographical resonances. Um, he lost his father before the age of three, and uh, he was brought up by his widowed mother, Shuprabharai, whom you see uh, as a young woman in the picture um, on the top, on the right. Um, this is the teenage Shotujit Rai with his mother, and then um, a much older Shuprabharai in a family photo from the 1950s. So a little bit about um, Ray's background, um, and this might be familiar knowledge for many of you, but just to make sure that we are on the, uh, but this has some relevance to what I'll talk about later. So Ray was born into a culturally prominent family of writers, artists, and entrepreneurs. Uh, his grandfather was a pioneer in um, children's literature and in printing technology. His father, Shukumar Rai, was a much loved writer of nonsense literature, um, but Ray didn't grow up in the culturally vibrant household. Um, where his father had grown up and into which Shuprabharai had married. Uh, after his father's death in 1923, the family business um, went bankrupt, the, all their assets had to be liquidated. And when Ray was six, um, he and his mother left the family home, went to live in the household of one of Shuprabharai's brothers. And that's where they lived till Ray got a job um, in his 20s and moved out. Uh, so he didn't grow up in affluence, although he did enjoy a lot of, he had access to a lot of cultural capital. Uh, his mother was quite a remarkable woman, uh, artistically very gifted, a uh, wonderful singer by all accounts. She took up a job at a women's vocational training school to support herself and her son. And Shotojit Rai was very close to his mother, but also by all accounts, including his own, was quite in awe of him well into adulthood. So um, there's an excerpt from an interview where he talks about the autobiographical resonance that um, Oporajita especially has for him. Of course, he didn't grow up in a village or went away to study, except for two years at Tagore's University in Shantiniketan, which was at his mother's behest. Um, and his mother did live with him till her death in 1960. But he said that he was able to identify the psychological dynamics of the relationship, so to get under the skin, as he puts it. Now, so it's interesting what he includes or amplifies um, and what he leaves out from the novel. And I just wanted to mention three of these. Um, the first thing I want to mention about the novel is that Opu's attitude towards his mother in the novel, for those of you um, whom I have read the novel might remember this, is um, the college-going Opu, at least, becomes uh, quite protective towards his mother. When he goes home to visit her, he's struck by how quickly she's aging. Uh, he sees her vulnerability and loneliness, uh, as well as a ten tendency to put his needs above hers. Um, he's anxious that she might not be around for much longer and treats her with a tenderness that almost suggests a reversal of roles. I'd be curious to see if you see traces of this in the film. The novel also has a wealth of details about Opu's everyday intellectual and emotional life in the city. Um, which obviously for cinematic reasons are telescoped into a few short scenes, a montage of a few short scenes in the film. But the most significant um, omission of a prominent element from the novel has to do with the character of Leela, um, a young girl who plays an important role in Opu's emotional life as he grows up. It's not exactly a love interest. They meet as children when Opu's mother's working for a family um, that's related to Re uh, Leela's family. And, Le and the young Leela and uh, the preteen Leela and the preteen Opu uh, strike up a friendship over their shared love of books and uh, distant places and adventure stories. Uh, then they lose touch. Opu reconnects with her when um, he goes to Calcutta quite accidentally. Um, again, nothing romantic develops between them, but Opu is quite drawn to her. And Ray was in two minds about including Leela as a character in the film because he felt that it might dilute the dramatic intensity of the mother-son relationship that most interested him. Despite his reservations, he did initially include Leela in his screenplay. 
Um, but after some problems with finding the right actor for the role, dropped the role. Uh, this is one of the actors um, you see. Tondra Bormon was one of the young actors whom he tried out for the role. That didn't quite work out. And eventually, he was quite happy to drop the role. And he said that after he did that, the film seemed to fall into place. And um, so I. And, and he said that it allowed him to tell the story, to depict the inner worlds of Opu and his mother and their changing relationship with, and I quote, the utmost economy of visual and oral phrases. And it might be interesting to talk about what you think the omission of Leela's character, whether you agree what the omission of Leela's character does to, uh, contributes to the film. I wanted to say um, a little bit about the actor who plays Shorbha Joya, Koruna Bandhubadhyay, or also referred to as Koruna Banerjee, um, spelled a couple of different ways. And um, I'd like to hear about what you think she brings to the role. So just a little bit about her background. She was a leftist activist, actor, writer, uh, born into a liberal, um, uh, a quite liberal middle-class family, not very rich, but with access, again, to a lot of cultural capital. She does her BA and um, her undergraduate degree and her postgraduate degree in English literature in Calcutta. And in 1943, at age 24, marries um, her MA classmate, Shubhrata Banerjee, whom you see in the photograph there. It was an intercaste marriage. Um, quite un relatively unusual at the time. Shubhrata Banerjee, her husband, was a left activist, and so through him she was drawn into the orbit of the left cultural movement of the 1940s, organized under the banners of the Indian People's Theatre Association, or the IPTA, which was a cultural wing of the Communist Party. So she regularly took part in IPTA performances when the party was banned, so it was quite a risky thing to do. So she had some stage experience in political and street theater when Shotojit Rai, a friend and colleague um, of uh, Shubhrata Banerjee, her husband, approached her for the uh, role of Shorbuja. And interestingly enough, her initial response was an emphatic no. And she was convinced by her in-laws and her husband that Pothir Pachali was a filmmaking enterprise worth taking part in. And I wanted to play just a short clip from an interview so she talks about that in, other, in her other writing. She wrote quite a bit about cinema, her own experience, but also about other films. And in interviews about how Shotu Jitrai's mode of direction made her feel that she, was, she had an authorial role in the creation of Shorba Joya. And you can tell that um, the role that she was persuaded to play and came to enjoy playing was very different from her real life uh, experience. Uh, so I'd like, I'd be curious to hear about what you think she brings to the role. And I wanted to um, also briefly point to her reading of Shorbu Joya, along with the two other characters she plays in two other Shotojit Rai films, uh, Horoshundori in Devi and Labonno in Kanchanjongha, which I think some of you have already seen. Um, she describes them in her writings as fighters in their everyday life and qu as quiet rebels. And um, she sees Shorbu Joya as single-handedly fighting poverty, holding, the life, uh, holding her family together, and in Oparajita against her own emotional needs and against forces she doesn't quite grasp very well. Um, she also talks about how the character of Shorbu Joya evolves uh, between Pothet Pacheli and Oparajita, and even within uh, Oparajita and um, talks about the underacting or the aesthetic of restraint that Shyotu Jitra encouraged and she embraced in both the films and especially in Oparajito, which led to rave reviews of her performance, but also some criticism that um, she was too sophisticated, her demeanor too urbane for uh, a village woman like Shorbu Joya, but, um, and I'd like to hear what you think about it. But I also think that this criticism might reveal more about stereotypical urban perceptions about what village women are supposed to be like, but more about that later. So um, let me see, yeah. So in the second part of my talk, I want to um, draw your attention to two objects, two elements of the mise-en-scene that become motives in Oparajito and that I think are quite central to the narrative and emotional arc the film traces. And you can see both those objects in this image. Um, Opu gazing intently at his prized possession, a globe that the headmaster of his village school um, gives to him as a gift after he does very well in the school leaving exams. 
um, and he's sitting in the train that's carrying him to Calcutta. Um, you, uh, you know, this is an image from the film as the train pulls into um, its destination. Now, while the mother-son relationship in Aparajita obviously has an emotional resonance across cultural or linguistic boundaries, and you can even think about it as a parent-child relationship, not just as a mother-son relationship, um, I think race treatment of these two objects or motives, the train and the globe, also embeds this very personal story in a larger story of Bengali modernity and cosmopolitanism. So I want to talk a little bit about that uh, through these objects. So the train, which is inextricably associated with um, the expansion of colonialism and colonial modernity in Bengal and also in India, is a lead motive that runs through all three films of the Apu trilogy. And you might remember that lyrical yet unsettling scene from Bothe Pachali, uh, where um, Opu and Durga accidentally see the uh, train when, they're, when they lose their way in a field of white flowers near the tracks. So the train there is an object of wonder, but also a disruptive force. And in Opu Shongsha, the third film, the adult Opu actually lives very close to the railway yard. So the noise of the train, the smoke, uh, these are always in the background. There's nothing particularly lyrical about the train there. So um, Ray said that the train in the first part sprang from the book, but then when he was making the second film, he thought that the train had to be there, especially as Opu is making the journey back and forth between the village and the city, and uh, that it would be interesting to have the train not just within sight of the village, but within sight of the house where Shorbuja and Opu come to live in Apurajito. Um, and in fact, he chose the house. Uh, that part of the film is shot mostly in an actual house. He chose the house because of, the prox of its proximity to the train tracks because you could see the train from the doorway. So the train is a constant visual and oral presence in the second half of Opera Jitu. Now he always claimed that he had never seen the three films together, but, um, and I quote, the people who have say it works beautifully with the trains as a kind of running motive. Um, symbolic yet realistic at the same time. Um, and so I'd like you to pay attention to the scenes where the train makes an appearance orally and or visually, and to hear about how you read this motive as it develops in Operajito, but also across the trilogy, because I'm assuming almost all of you here would have seen all three films by the end of today's screening. The other object that I would like you to look closely at is the globe. Um, and it might be interesting to think after the screening about the meanings it comes to acquire in the course of the film for Opu, but also for Shorbu Jaya and for us as viewers. It becomes quite central to the film's depiction of the relationship between Opu and Shorbu Jaya and its depiction of Opu's journey into, as he makes his way into the world. So much so that it's there in the cover image of the DVD um, that Criterion releases after the film's restoration. So the historian Sumati Ramaswamy um, has a fascinating book called Terrestrial Lessons, where she looks at the role uh, of the globe in the pedagogic production in colonial India of a certain way of being in the world, of a certain curiosity about the world. And she reads the globe in Aparajito as a symbol of the colonial education that propels Opu into the world and away from the village. However, I'd Apologies for the techno fumbling. I'm not a PC person, I'm more of a Mac person, so I'm, I will hit the wrong button from time to time. So what I'd like to suggest is that Opu's attachment to the globe in this film can also be read as a marker of a certain cosmopolitan imagination of the world that was no doubt influenced by the pedagogic project of colonial modernity, but not entirely defined by it. And before I go on to say more, I'd like to offer a brief gloss on how I'm using the word cosmopolitan, which is a word that attaches itself to Ray uh, very early on in his career. He was routinely referred to as a director equally at ease in the East and in the West, as a man astride two cultures. And he himself reinforced this image by repeatedly describing himself and his world, his cultural background as a fusion of the East and the West. But this binary formulation, which reduces race cosmopolitanism to a rather ahistorical, placeless fusion of a monolithic East and a monolithic West, doesn't quite capture the 
lived experience or specificity of a situated cosmopolitanism, its uniquely Bengali provenance, because it was rooted in a very hybrid, but nonetheless distinctively Bengali cultural space or milieu centered in Calcutta, but not confined to it. Um, this space was marked by the intermingling of a Bengali liberal humanism, itself a very hybrid formation, with the seductive pleasures of a globally circulating popular culture, such as children's books and magazines, adventure stories, Hollywood films, and comics, and of course, the cultural ferment, cultural and political ferment of Calcutta in the 1930s and 40s when Ray comes of age. Oparajit and some of uh, Shrotajit Rai's other films and much of his prolific fiction for children suggest that we can think about cosmopolitanism in terms of an imagined relationship to the world at large and not in terms of the, ex of the experiential privilege of travel. So this is a way of imagining the world and inhabiting imagined worlds that's predicated on a sense of wonder, wonder understood as a sense of astonishment mingled with curiosity. Um, and it's a relationship sustained by an ability to conjure up multiple worlds and to go traveling in them virtually. And the virtual bit is really important. As you'll see, there are some fascinating scenes in Operajito that visualize this virtual relationship, this practice of world making quite wonderfully, making the film a really rich resource, at least for me, um, for thinking about cosmopolitanism outside an Eurocentric framework and from the vantage point of a particular lived experience of modernity in colonial and post-colonial Bengal. What you see in this passage, in the sequences in the film, is a distillation of several evocative passages from Bibhuti Bhushan Mondapadhyaya's novel, um, Pothir Pachali and Aparajitu, which acquaint us with the boys Opu's blooming romance with the world, what Bibhuti Bhushan calls in a beautiful phrase, Dudet Pipasha, or his thirst for the distant. This is just one of many such passages which follow Opu as he roams around his ancestral village before his family leaves the village. Um, dreaming about the distant places he, re he obsessively reads about in the few books and old issues of Bengali period periodicals he stumbles upon at home and in the libraries of affluent neighbors. And he dreams of going to these distant places, feels that these places are waiting for him. Now, in the film, Opu's yearning for the world and his ability to imaginatively situate himself in multiple contexts beyond the immediate confines of uh, the village where he lives, is still fueled by books, but the years of haphazard reading and serendipitous discoveries described in loving detail in the novel is cinematically condensed into a longish single sequence towards the middle of the film, which starts with a conversation with the headmaster of Opu's village, village school, who is acutely aware of his marginal location, but says that that's no reason why we should confine our minds to that location. So... Um, in fact, he seems to suggest that because you feel that, because you don't feel that you're at the center of the world, your desire for the world can be more intense and your, the horizons of your imagination more expansive. And in order to expand uh, Opu's horizons, he hands him a number of books about scientific inventions, distant places, explorers. So the headmaster is clearly inducting Opu into a pedagogical project, a child-centered progressive pedagogical project, but a pedagogical project nonetheless. But in the novels, as well as in the film, Opu is shown as turning it through creative play into his own adventure. Into what Bibhuti Bhushan described in the novel, and I quote as Opu's enduring romance with learning, one that was essentially a romance with the world, as it involved the diversity of an unknown world gradually revealing itself to him. So I'd like to emphasize two things here very quickly. For Opu in the film, as well as in the novels, this involves not a passive act of immersion, but an ongoing co-creation of an immersive virtual reality or multiple immersive realities that are not confined just to the West. The other point that I want to make is about the books that the headmaster hands to Opu and the sequence more generally is that it reminds me of a passage from Ray's memoir of his childhood, Jokon Choto Chilam, when I was young, where he describes long afternoons spent on his own when his mother would be away at work, leafing through the 10 volumes of the Book of Knowledge, an encyclopedia for children that did the rounds of the British Empire in the early decades of the 20th century, and the four volumes of uh, The Romance of Great Lives that his mother had brought for him. So there's some very interesting work on how the Book of Knowledge relied on a pedagogy of wonder and how it was creatively appropriated in the various colonial contexts in which it circulated, one of which we see in Oparajito. So I want to emphasize the overlaps between Opu's and Shotujit Rai's imaginative worlds growing up, 
Despite the gulf of cultural privilege that separates Opu, the son of a poor village priest, and Opu's creator, Vibhuti Bhushan, again a village schoolmaster whose father was an impoverished itinerant storyteller, from Shotujit Rai, whose multiple familial connections to members of Kolkata's cultural elite had prompted a mischievous classmate at school to ask him if it were indeed true that George V, who was then the King of England, was related to him. But despite that um, cultural gulf, Shotujit Rai and Opu and many other Bengali children in early to mid 20th century India, who had access to certain kinds of cultural capital, and by that I mean resources to, or the ability to access certain kinds of books, or education or discourses, an ability that wasn't always commensurate with financial affluence. So they seem to share a certain imagination of the world, a desire to participate in distant worlds, um, an ability to conjure up uh, worlds of the imagination, drawing uh, on books, magazines, images, films, travel writings, and personal interactions, and to imaginatively locate themselves in that kind of, um, in these kinds of worlds. And in Shotajit Rai's fiction for children, there are other sedentary characters like Opu dreaming the world into being from the remote corners of Bengal. And in the interest of time, I just want to mention two of them. One is Bonku Babu in a short story for children um, that Shotujit Rai writes, I think sometime in the early to mid 80s. Uh, Bonku Babu is a mild mannered man who teaches geography at a village school. Um, he hasn't even seen much of Bengal, let alone the world. Yet he's able to regale his students with wondrous tales about Africa, about the forests in Brazil about the discovery of the poles, about the lost continent of Atlantis. And eventually, he meets an alien um, whom we see in this image. This is Shotujit Rai's illustration for his own story. And the alien offers him a chance to see the world through a device that he hands uh, to him, through which he can see, as if on a movie screen, the scenes that he had only dreamt about. The second character that I want to mention is Nokur Babu, who is a recurring character in the science fiction stories that Shotujit Rai writes, featuring Professor Shonku. Nokur Babu again lives in a remote village, but is able to see not just the world, but events from the distant past and the future in his mind's eye, so vividly that he can actually project these visions into the external world and make others see them. And he's doing this solely on the basis of books by obscure authors about history, geography, science, the wonders of the world, um, quite similar to the books that the headmaster hands, uh, gives Opu to read. So Bonku Babu, Nokur Babu, and Opu exemplify uh, both the limits and possibilities of Bengali colonial modernity, which had to do with a huge gap between the material resources available to educated Bengali middle classes and the expansive cultural horizons that they could access. This gap and the constricting confines of Bengali middle class life often generated a wanderlust that did not lead to actual travel, but led to prodigious feats of virtual wanderings. And this predicament is quite wonderfully captured by Bibhuti Bhushan, the writer of Pathir Pachali, who in 1937 publishes an adventure story for children called Chade Pahar or the Mountain of the Moon. And in this passage um, from the beginning of the novel, we see uh, the protagonist Shankar, an adventurous young man of slender means, despairing over the possibility that he might be compelled to take up a tedious clerical job instead of setting off to see the world as he wants to do and as he eventually does. Uh, it's very similar in some ways to the situation in which Opu finds himself, uh, especially in the third film of the trilogy, the gap between uh, his dreams and his reality. But coming back to Oporajito, I want to just remind you that the story of cosmopolitan imagining as utopian world making, um, a theme that it shares with some of Shotujit Rai's later films, his children's fiction, and also writings on cinema, and more broadly with a strand of Bengali literature, it gets intertwined in the film with the story of Opu's mother. And so the film offers, um, offers us a privileged glimpse of not just the world opening up for Opu, but also of the reality that his mother inhabits and her inner world. And the question I would like us to think about is this. If we pay attention to this intertwining, to the nuances of Koruna Banerjee's performance as Shorbhujaya, does it affect our reading of Opu's story, of the story of world making, utopian world making? Um, our reading of the film's staging of the relationship between the modern and the traditional or its experience, or its imagination of the experience of colonial modernity in Bengal. Now, some commentators on the Opu trilogy, as some of you already know, have seen the film as tracing a linear narrative of progress and um, 
as having an affinity with India's first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru's vision for India, which was characterized by secular nationalism, a cosmopolitan outlook, an emphasis on social reform, and an unshakable faith in science and progress. So by way of conclusion, I'd like to pose this question. Do you see um, you know, um, a question that I would like us to come back to after the screening? How do you read the film's story um, of modernity? Is its narrative of progress, its euphoric evocation of Opu's romance with the world shadowed by other emotions, other experiences? Is there any ambivalence there in his account of colonial modernity and the cosmopolitan imagination that emerges out of it? I look forward to talking about this after the screening and I want to make sure we have enough time for discussion, so I'll stop here. But before um, ending, I do want to draw our attention to a fleeting image from the film that I noticed on my second viewing and that I keep going back to since then, the urchins at the corner of the frame in which we see Opu approaching the boarding house where he's going to stay um, when he goes to college. So the urchins, but also the little girl who seems to be keeping an eye on them. And I want to remind us that, this margin, this, uh, that these marginal figures, literally at the corner of the frame here, remind us that Opu's story, which is sometimes described as the story of every Bengali, does not actually tell the story of every Bengali. While social shifts in attitudes and gender norms and um, expansion of opportunities might make it no longer just a boy's story for Bengalis, access to the kind of cosmopolitan imagination that Obu develops is still dependent on accidents of birth, like class and caste position and familial resources or encouragement and access to certain kinds of cultural capital that often depend on these accidents of birth. Thank you. All right, well, we have some time for dis discussing the film. Uh, Bjorn has a revving mic for questions from the audience, but I think maybe I wanted to kick off by uh, asking Manishito a couple of questions on my end. First of all, uh, you mentioned that um, this is a film where like, the spectator's own perspective changes. The more times you see it, the uh, different stages in life in which you see it, perhaps the uh, one specific, one's identification shifts away from Apu and more towards the mother, if, particularly if you become a parent yourself, I guess, um, or not. But I mean, I, older, yeah. as a parent, I <laughs> certainly identify with this, the, the tragedy of the mother, like, mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, this kind of, this, this, the fear of separation, let's say, the fear of, of uh, of the child, like leaving and, and being having this feeling of abandonment mm -hmm. that, that the mother clearly uh, suffers from so profoundly. Uh, maybe we could start with that then. <laughs> yeah, um, as I had mentioned at the beginning, that my relationship with the film has evolved over time. And when I first saw the film, I was in my mid teens, I think. Um, and, and not just the first time, the first few times I saw the film in my teens and my 20s, I focused more on Opu and his excitement over the globe, over discovering the world. And it was only, um, act, and, and in my case, I think it was more as a child who grows up and experiences loss or is on the verge of experiencing the loss of a certain world that had sustained me. Um, that's when I started noticing, I think from my early 30s onwards, after a number of experiences of loss or, you know, anxieties about imminent loss, I started noticing, looking more at Sharbojaya, and I realized that a lot of the sequences, especially in the second half of the film, really offer you more than one focal point. And uh, for instance, in that scene where Opu is trying to explain what a globe is to his mother, when his mother has agreed to let him go to Calcutta. Um, and, you know, the first couple of times when I, I saw the film, I focused on Opu's excitement about the world and the way in which he says, our world. And it was only later that I realized that Opu is looking at the globe, Shorbuja is looking at Opu, not at the globe. And you realize that it's a world, she gets his excitement, she can understand, if not wholly get his excitement about the world, but it's not her world. It's not a world where she can um, accompany Opu, and she's very aware of that. 
while Opu, it doesn't quite register with Opu, right? Uh, it, and, and you realize, looking at it after, you know, um, when, or at least I did when I was a bit older, um, that it was as much Shorbhajaya's story or more Shorbhajaya's story than Opu's story. And it also makes it a wrenching watch um, every time I watch it now, although I keep obsess going back to it obsessively and watching it. Um, and, um, and I think it's, it's sort of come to haunt me and many others like us um, and, and kind of made us realize our parallels with Opu's story, not just, and, and realize that Opu's story as well is not just a story of adventure and discovering new worlds. It's also a story of loss. He doesn't quite understand as long as his mother is alive. But his um, you know, journey into new worlds um, is, is shadowed by the loss of the worlds that he has to lose in order to do that. And so, yes, as a parent, uh, uh, definitely your perspective shifts. But even um, before you become a parent, you, you, I think it's, 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 you, you start understanding the perspective of Sharbhujaya, but also you start seeing something retrospectively about Opu's story that Opu can't see at that point. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I mean, it is it is interesting how the, over the course of the film, the emotional core shifts away from Apu and then much more towards mm -hmm. Um But then also that we, as I suspect it as a kind of thing to us, I, I don't know, maybe just me, but uh, Apu, like, Apu's obliviousness to what's going on in, in his mother, which is something I think people, you know, it's not uncommon to be, mm -hmm. let's say, not paying attention to what emotional turmoil your own parents are. Experiencing, yeah. but this film really cruelty. highlights it. Yeah, they're, they're just that he's not noticing it, like he doesn't yeah. see it at, at all until it's kind of too late, basically. Yeah. Um, and that's also the kind of tragedy of the film, in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, that he's kind of not attentive to what his own mother is kind of uh, yeah going through. It's actually, if you read the novel, he's much more aware of the loss that's coming heading towards him and he he's actually much more attentive to his mother he um and it's interesting that um, uh, he um, in the film sharbajaya forbids her neighbors to write to opu um, opu actually goes to um, uh, the neighbor kind of overrides her objections writes to opu opu actually goes to see his mother and is able to see him uh, see her one last time before she dies uh, she's he's still not there when she dies but she does she see him and i at least don't see any traces of the kind of tenderness um, or concern that opu displays towards his mother in the novel i mean for instance his mother would ask him um, to tell her, tell her stories just as she used to tell him stories when he was a child, and he would tell her stories from the books he was reading rather than falling asleep, as he does in the film. So I've always wondered about why um, Ray obviously noticed the details as well, but chose not to highlight that. And in some ways, is much harsher towards Opu, with whom he's, you know, uh, uh, to some extent identifying, uh, than Vibhuti Bhushan is in the novel. Maybe I'll, uh, just one last question, and I'll hand over to Ritika. I mean, do you think the I I, I want to be tentative in this question, but is there an excessiveness to the mother's need for a connection with Apu? Does it feel like it's too much? The whole thing with the food as well, kind of. That's where I started getting. Is this a stand-in for uh, something else going on between them? She seems to take such a delight in him appreciating her food and you know there's a jealousy there as well and she's there like is, oh do they make better food than i do and you know it's kind of forcing her, she's forcing him to kind of say no you make the best food mom like yeah, I, I saw a, a lot of pathos in that question in that exchange mm -hmm. rather than excess because that's the only thing she can kind of connect to she doesn't quite understand uh, what he tells her about, if he tells her at all anything in the novel he does about her, her cl his classes, his life, but the only thing she can kind of latch on to is food, right? And and in a way, uh, again, my mother was nothing like Shorbuja in many ways, very, very reserved, but, um, you know, well into my 40s, whenever I called her, that would be the second question she asked. <laughs> Did you eat today? <laughs> so, and again, so I, I think, 
as I said, some, some of th that exchange became much more poignant to me when I realized, uh, you know, as I said, not the first time, not on the second viewing. So I, I don't know, and this might be a good question to uh, pose to the audience. How, what did you uh, think? Was there a, how did you read? Well, I think Ritika and then Kaya. Vincent can have a say. Um, uh, I just wanted to add to the uh, point you made about how Opu's tenderness is kind of not there in the film. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was thinking that maybe it's there, but in a very compressed way, because it's like, you know, just less than a two hour film and mm -hmm. like a novel. But he does give him like those two moments, right? One when he comes back from the train station. Deliberately lying. Deliberately yeah. lying. Yeah. And uh, he understands what his mother is going through. But the poignant point that I always read in the film, or rather read over like a period of time once mm -hmm. I kind of, grew up a little and then watched the film again, is also the fact that it's uh, he understands the loneliness of his mother, yet mm -hmm. he is able to do the uh, things he needs to do for, his hims for himself. It's that moment, you know, it's not that it's one or the other, yeah. but it's the fact that that um, uh, it's the ability to put both, both of those things together and hold them together, and that's his tragedy in a way. You know, it's how I always read it, that it's not that he doesn't get it. Yeah. He get it a little bit, but he'll still go to call. He's still know. drawn to the other. He'll still, yeah. he's going to live the world that he wants to live and he's going to do it. But yeah. there is that sense in which that supersedes some sense, you know, when he's like so happy that I've managed it, you know, like with the mother. Yeah, which I'm didn't go down at all well with the Bengali audience. There were lots of very, even now, there are sort of angry comments about what sort of a comment is that? You're managing your mother, so. Exactly, right? Like it's this, uh, I mean, of course, that at that point, the film doesn't want you to <laughs> identify too much with him, maybe. <laughs> but but it's there, right? It's this conflict yeah. that uh, is captured through this kind of like, uh, um, a life for a person migrating from, you know, leaving their parents behind. Yeah. That sense of loss is for him too. It's a sense of loss. Yeah, absolutely. But he fills it up with something else. And for his mother, there is nothing else. Yeah. It's just him. Yeah. And, and for his mother, I mean, she could have made much more of a scene. There could have been much more emotional excess. And if you see some other more mainstream Bengali films, uh, mothers, the, sacri the, you know, the sacrificing mother is, is bombastically so very, very verbal <laughs> about what she is giving up. While here, after that initial conflict, right, when she slaps him probably for the only time in his life, um, she sort of holds back. And I, I think in a way, I do agree with Koruna Banerjee when she says that Shorbuja is also fighting, not poverty so much in the second half of this film, but fighting her own need for Opu, her own emotional need for Opu, and, and sort of pulling back. There's a very fleeting moment when she's at the door yeah. and, he, and he looks back and she, her face is quite, we can see her face, it's quite sad. The moment he looks back, she smiles at him and then the smile fades again. So there is that, she, he's, she's constantly fighting her own, she doesn't want to become an obstacle in Opu's in path, his. right? So that's her tragedy yeah. in a way. But there's, as you said, there's nothing else for her to fill up the emptiness with. Briefly, I, I was also going to say that the, in the the tenderness and the acknowledgement uh, of the mother's uh, difficult situation, I think, is there in the scene when he comes back from the train station. Um, one, one of the things that I found striking about both the uh the film as opposed to the novel is that um, Ray uh, simplifies things. The, the relationship of the mother to the daughter in in Bibuti Bouchon's novel is much more complex. Uh, in with way, uh, in, Durga. In, in yeah. Durga, in, yeah, in yeah. Potter Potter, and, and actually she's much more cruel to the yeah. daughter than than in the film. Yeah. And and I think it's significant he showed us the wonderful cover design he made for the for the children's version of Potter Pocholi. Uh -huh. um, one of the things that Ray is really good at, as we know from the Feludon books, is to let's say scale things down to to different audiences yeah. to to adjust stories to um uh let's say different levels of understanding or presumed understanding mm -hmm. 
And and so the, one of the things, I, or one one of the ways I was reading this film is that <clears throat> he, in a way, again simplifies things and goes for what he thinks is really most relevant. Yeah. And and I thought I really liked what you said about the performance and drawing our attention to mm-hmm. uh, Corona Bonucci's performance here. Um, the the really complex she, the stuff she does is all for the camera. Yeah. Um, and w- we can always tell what part of her performance is for the sun, and and actually yeah. the most difficult moments are always for us. Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, the way the sun behaves, you sort of ha- still have a sense that he. He understands what's going on, but he doesn't want to look. Yeah, he, at least he has some inkling as to what go, what's going on, but he doesn't want to look too closely at that because, yes, definitely. But I also wonder, and again, not not psychoanaly- psychoanalyzing Ray at all, but um, I, I, because when he makes this film, he's in his thirties, so significantly older than Opus. He's also kind of looking back. Um, just as I am looking, I was looking back in my thirties at the film, and 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 it's sort of he's looking back at the story, and I wonder if that makes him hard. I mean, he he does include some of that tenderness, but uh, in a very very scaled down way, right? So, and I wonder if some of that has to do with his perspective when he rereads the film, and uh, some of his. Uh, what I read as a, as, a, as a degree of harshness towards Opu. I mean, you can always be very self, you know, when you're kind of passing judgment on a version of yourself, you can be far more critical. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, that's my, I've always wondered about that. Yes, up the back here. Do we know anything about the causes of the deaths? I mean, the daughter dies uh, in the first part. Mm-hmm. It seems somehow for me um, the family is cursed. And um, maybe we have some information on that in the novel. Thank you. Um, the daughter dies of protracted fever from which she never quite recovers. I, uh, malnutrition has a lot to do with it. I mean, they were quite poor, and uh, I think there are details in the novel when, uh, and and that was fairly common um, to, vis-a-vis girl children in impoverished families. The boy would get more food, so Durga. So there was, you know, systematic malnutrition. Um, also, they were too poor to to afford to afford a doctor. So the doctor comes when it's too late. Um, so some kind of viral fever, which was very common in uh, rural Bengal um, back then, even now, um, and could turn deadly without uh, proper nutrition and medical treatment. The father, it's not quite clear. Uh, they say in the film, congestion, you know, some kind of lung infection. Uh, again, Shorbu Joya, I think it's a gradual sort of uh, um, erosion of her health. I don't know if you noticed, but the, uh, when Opu comes home, after uh, the headmaster informs him that uh, he has won the scholarship, Shorba Joya is sitting, he's, she's actually making a herbal remedy, similar to the kind that she makes for her husband shortly before he dies. So she, she's already aware that her health is not, she's not in the pink of health. She even hints to Opu, but Opu doesn't hear that because um, he's fallen asleep by the time, right? During one of a, a, a later conversation. So um, again, with her, um, I think it's uh, nothing, there's nothing in the novel. Again, uh, protracted fever, uh, a fever that wouldn't go away, which is possibly symptomatic of something else, but um, just a hard life and heartbreak. We, we really are meant to read it, though, as dying of heartbreak in the end, in yeah. the case of the mother. Yeah. But then we don't need another explanation. Yeah. She's just exactly. a broken woman at this point. Yeah. Um, which makes it all the more effective, it seems to me. Uh I maybe wanted to ask a question about um, the role of architecture in the film, particularly in the first part of the film, because mm-hmm. it seems to me it has this very strong presence in that first part in particular. The, the city. Kind of, the city, yeah, and the kind of almost the stonework of the city seems to me very present and also like 
has this looming quality or this almost macabre quality, particularly the scene in the, I guess, the temple with the monkeys and so on and so forth, that this is kind of like this old world that is still present and still mm-hmm. kind of exerting an influence on the characters, uh, but like f- from a, a kind of distant past or something. I don't know if you'd had thoughts on the role of architecture in that. Part yeah, of the I mean, film. Ray was fascinated by Varanasi, and he actually said when he was rereading Operajito, the thing that he found the most compelling was that passage I spoke about, but the uh, next most compelling thing was the possibility of um, setting the film partly in Varanasi because he said that the city is so. He had visited the city um, by the time he was rereading Operajito, and he said he, he always said he found the city really photogenic. He, one mm. of his later films, a children's film. Um, detective story uh, starring Feluda about him who wrote um, you know, several novels for children. Uh, Joy Baba Felunath is set in Varanasi and, and the city, uh, it's a color film, so the city emerges in a, uh, appears in a somewhat different way. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, he, he, I think one of the, um, in the first half of the film, it's very clear that his, what holds his interest is the, uh, is the, is the nature of the city. It's one of the most ancient cities. Um, even though it's it's a very crowded city, but uh, there is a sense of the old world kind of looming over you, yeah. and in some but surreal ways, it is infested with monkeys. <laughs> uh, so that's what I, I, I that was my main memory of the city, visiting the city as a child, um, and also there are many layers there. So Varanasi was a city where widowed women would be sent off by their families, and they would spend the rest of their lives there in this city in North India where they didn't understand the language, um, you know, uh, lead, uh, uh, basically lead quite precarious lives. And you see many of these women surrounding Opu's father when he is sort of reading out from the uh, Puranas, translating it for them. Uh, these are all widows of various ages. And so um, there are many, le- it's sort of a palimpsest of um, ancient India, more modern memories of heartbreak, um, and 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 just the carts the by the river, uh, the kind of activities going on there from this from the sacred to the profane. I think Ray was also drawn to that. So it has it has this ominous and kind of haunting quality about it, absolutely. But then on the other hand. Apu seems to take such a delight in exploring the place, right? Like this is also his almost his playground in a yeah. sense, um, and he and this is kind of you know it gets accentuated later with his kind of interest in the globe and the world and finding new places and so on and so forth. Building a this, sundial, yeah. Yeah, he, I mean he's like a almost an explorer, like going through this lost city and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, yeah. which shows it in another in another kind of light, I guess. Yeah. Um, but Vincent, yeah, uh, uh, um, two two quick add-ons. Uh, coming back to the question of health hazards, um, mm-hmm. I, I would have also said on my very limited uh, knowledge of uh, Bengali fiction, people die easily in these stories. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like a, Russian novels, everyone's, a lot, everyone's yeah. getting consumption at, at convenient right. points in the there's, novel. There's a lot of health hazards, but but in this particular case, the, my reading always is that the guy he meets at the river is carrying a virus or of some sort, because the, on the soundtrack you can hear clearly hear that he's coughing all the time. Oh, and, and yeah, and, and he does say that that he's sort of. Losing his voice, that's Just why I wanted to drink tea. He needs to have a tea, so so he's sort of, I, I've always read I this as him. I actually never yeah, thought about that. Bringing him, him bringing some sort of infection okay. into the household. And then, then when he leaves, he also asks him about where can I find a prostitute, so he's... Oh, no, uh, no, he asks, he wants to get married. Oh, he wants to get married. Yeah, so he's, and he doesn't have enough money, and he says, oh, I really want to have a family. Do you know of any oh, eligible women? Okay. Yeah, not a prostitute. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so. But in any case, I mean, he seems not healthy. Um, yeah, but I think there are signs that e- even before he meets this guy, uh, uh, Shorbujaya asks him to drink a share of Opu's milk because he's clearly worried that he's not doing that well. Right. Uh, and that's actually an interesting prospect because he is coughing, the other guy. So, yeah. But I hadn't um, quite... I thought more about the contrast between his style of Kothokotha, which is uh, what... Horihar is doing. It's sort of a combination of cha- reading 
out slokas in Sanskrit and telling stories. And I thought he was more there as a foil to Horihar's style of Kothakotha, which is very classical, very austere, low key. Right. While the other guy, if you follow the Bengali, he's using very colloquial Bengali, some spicy language about Krishna and Radha. So uh, I had always thought about the contrast being a sort of self reflexive one about race kind of filmmaking. Right. And more mainstream cinema, but uh, so I had um, kind of been oblivious to. So thank you for point for raising that possibility. Yeah, but, but the point you're making is is really interesting about the different styles. But that's something that's lost in translation, obviously. Yeah, because yeah. It's a, the linguistic the, nuances yeah, yeah. where uh, you get that. And if I might just quickly add something about death. Um, yeah, people die a lot in Bengali mm -hmm. fiction, uh, and. Uh, uh, and you know, you hear family in family lore. There are always the siblings mm. or the relatives who die premature deaths, including Shotojit Rai's father. He died at thirty-six. Right. right. So, um, but uh, Rai was also very fascinated with death, and he's talked about how death presents a really formidable, ch a really a challenge that filmmakers cannot resist, because how do you film death? So, um, yes. There's a lot of death, but he's also drawn to, I think, to it, yes. or at least at this stage. Another little remark on the on the topic of architecture. Um, Ranjani Madhundar uh -huh. last week said it's time to write a longer piece or a book on set design in Ray. Yeah. Um, and and again, I think this is a wonderful example. First of all, one of the great things about Ray um, are the minor characters, mm -hmm. the, the guys who have one or two scenes. And stay in the memory, and they're just yeah. absolutely memorably drawn um, sketches of, of fully rounded characters. Yeah. So to speak. And in this particular case, the, the upstairs neighbor um, is is the slightly story. debauched yeah, one. Yeah, the slightly yeah. debauched one, and then the whole story is told via the bottles and the pictures on the wall. Yeah. So, so that's those are very very careful choices. Yeah, yeah, and they are kind of, and it's very uh, uh, true to that period. So these are sort of. I guess Bengali versions of pinup girls, exactly. yeah, which you would find in periodicals, um, and yeah, so it's sort of conveyed through these very visual details. Also, I think his shoes, yeah. shoes carry a lot of significance in race films, and those kinds of shoes are always associated with some kind of villainous streak. Yeah, absolutely, and I didn't get to talk about Bongshi Chandragupta, who worked with Ray on. Almost all his films on the set design, uh, uh, starting with Pothir Pachali till John Bhongshi Chandragupta died quite prematurely, um, and and there's very little on him. And set designs are also so ephemeral. But uh, there is a wonderful book, at least one wonderful book, if not more, waiting to be written about that. Because a lot of, I mean, obviously Ray projects himself as an auteur, and here's one. But he had these longtime collaborators who play a very significant, to me, an authorial role in many of his films. Koruna Banerjee is one of them, Bongshi Chandragupta, his set, uh, art director being another one. Um, Ritika, yes. Um, it just made me realize the at the end, mm -hmm. when Opu is leaving the home, um, he uh, is not wearing any shoes. Mm -hmm. And when he hears, uh, just a few minutes before, when he hears about his mother's death and he has arrived, and there's a scene in which he's crying, but he's also taking off his shoes first, which to me felt very like there was some symbolism going there, but at the same time, it was just, you know, matter um, of fact. But then it's why would an, he? It's, a, uh, it's actually a very realistic ritual. I had to ask my mother because yeah. I was, uh, I used to, you know, I, I wasn't brought up in a. Uh, uh, brought up in a, in a household that didn't observe any rituals. So when the first time I saw it, I noticed that. And, and then when she pointed it out, it struck, it, I realized that that's, uh, you know, in conservative, um, or not even conservative, observant Hindu families, um, when someone dies, the, the very close relations, especially children, are supposed to spend, there's a, I forget what the prescribed period is, but a few weeks without wearing shoes or stitched clothes and, and follow a very strict diet. So the shoes would be a reference to that. I mean, Ray was a stickler for detail, even though he grew up in the Brahmo Shamaj where they wouldn't possibly have followed this ritual. Um, maybe a uh, question on the role of the trains you brought up trains in the lecture and uh, across the whole trilogy uh, yeah but in this film they certainly uh given a kind of 
uh, to use the pun, an emotional freighting, perhaps, um, that almost seems to... I mean, uh, the mother is almost bedeviled by the fact that the train line passes right in front of their house, which means every time a train goes by and it doesn't have a poo on it, like she's kind of yeah. taunted or tormented by it. Uh, so there's something really, um, like, emotionally... Uh, devastating about this <laughs> just just like just the like the train on the horizon going past the house and every or even the sound of the, the train in the distance yeah. it becomes really uh sort of haunting mm, right mm. a kind of a haunting sound and yeah it's 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 a sim it's sort of a sign of her connection it's now her main connection in a very mm. realistic sense to opu but also a sign of her disconnection right uh, uh so yeah there's definitely an emotional freighting but i was curious as to how uh, now that you know uh, if, if others in the audience had uh, any thoughts on the train, how you see it developing across the films or in this film? Whether you saw it as a, a, a kind of thread that ties the films together or not? It's interesting because I was thinking about this critique of Ray um, by Gita Kapoor, for instance, and I think it's a very necessary critique where she talks about the Opu trilogy, especially allegorizing the story of Ray's own class. Ab ab it absolutely does that. But I also agree, you know, and I agree with Moinak Bishwas, who was here a few weeks ago, I think, and he has a wonderful essay where he points out, he basically says, yes, that critique was very necessary, but it possibly also is overlooking a few uh, crucial aspects of the film, then we need to revisit the film in non-allegorical terms. Um, and I think there's a motives like the train, or even the globe, which is a sign of Opus' discovery of new worlds, but it's also the world that comes between him and his mother. Uh, I think it's the how these motives develop in a very understated way most of the time, um, which I think if you if if you you know if you look at these closely, it's hard to sustain that critique that that there is a seamless narrative of progress, uh, that the film glosses that the Opu trilogy glosses over, uh, glosses over ruptures and contradictions, um, and for me the way the train kind of the train imagery becomes more and more freighted with um, kind of really burdensome emotions, mm -hmm. I think, across the trilogy is one of them. Um, it makes me realize also, like, at the beginning of the film, when there's a, a scene from a train, so we see the, yeah. you know, from the bridge and... The struts the of the bridge, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we enter the city, and then the most, like, one of the most uh, surprising scenes that always gets me in the film is when um, uh, uh, Apu's mother decides to leave that family house. And, uh, but we don't really see, like, her decision, maybe you just see her, like, standing, looking at the camera, towards the camera, and then it cuts to the shot of them in the train. Mm -hmm. And then she's looking out at the city, kind of, you know, leaving it behind, and then Bengal comes in, and you know, it's like all the green. Uh, There's one of her rare smiles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's like uh, you know, you kind of smile when you look at that. It's like beautiful, but it's also like so poignant because they're in a way going backwards. You know, yeah. it's yeah. like a migration that happened, but in a way they're also going. And then she is so confused. You know, she has brought him back, um, supposedly rescuing him from this future that she just didn't see for him there. You know, he's carrying that tobacco for this figure right he's preparing and the hookah for the yeah um, how, yeah so know, he's become like a servant in yeah, this house and, they both are and um it's not for herself that she realizes it but it's for apu and then immediately she takes him back to yeah. you know um, and then he's doing the rituals of being like this you know um uh, observant Brahmin. Or uh, he's the, basically he's earning a living as a priest, exactly. as a priest, apprentice priest. Yes, yeah. so apprentice priest. So he's, and then she's like, you know, kind of satisfied that this is the more kind of apt. Uh, but it doesn't seem to uh, cohere with his idea of moving forward, you know. So it's the film's very like moving back and forth in time, is what I'm trying to say, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't see a linear, uh, pro, you know, journey into the future, the constant looping back and forth. Even Opu can't quite break free, as you pointed out, right? He's constantly coming back and forth. And his last journey, when we know that he won't come back again, it's not a happy journey. She also, I mean, doesn't seem to have much reason to be back in this countryside uh, setting. Who? The mother. Uh, like, what is she doing there as well? She doesn't really have a 
a role. She doesn't have a kind of, I don't know. Yeah, it's a more raison d'etre in a way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because she was earning in the. I mean, it's not yeah. that she was entirely you know happy but she was not desperately Mm. unhappy either so it's entirely because of her son and talking about sort of reverse migration or the looping back and forth uh even in this film there are a couple of times when he uh when she tells opu before opu goes off to the city when he's still young um you know now that you have a, a you know as you when you grow up you learn a good living as a priest and maybe we can go back to our ancestral village which he never does, but Opu does in the film very briefly. Parks his son there and go, goes off to see the world again in the novel. But Intense. Now, just a, a quick inventory of scenes from all three films <laughs> to undermine the argument of the linear uh-huh. uh, <laughs> allegory of linear progress. I think the, the first appearance of the train in Porto Portoli, uh, already the, the landscape, the field, the plants, and, yeah. and the, the smoke of the train that, that has its own organic yeah. sort of look to it and there's the tension between the rural world and the technology but the technology is sort of also organicized and and brought into in the rural world um and then in in opus Ansar, the, the the rail yard and the untouchables who like the the dalits who live there um which you know thematize the persistence of the caste system yeah. Uh, in in the in 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 this seemingly seamless world world of yeah. progress, and then maybe in in here, it's again the landscape, the the train appearing at the horizon, um, again as sort of a quasi organic element of of the landscape, but also in tension with it. So it's yeah, yeah, and of course um, the scene with the bridge, which opens the film, um, and which is accompanied by the, the date. From the Bengali calendar, you know, it's Which it's the year uh, we we see we see where where the, the film opens with the lateral traveling from yeah. the train yeah. bridge, and then there's a title stating the year of the action, which is according 1920. to 1920. Yeah, it's, they, they it's give the Bengali year, the Bengali calendar. It, it, they said 1327, which would really be 1920. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. but yeah, but but it's basically what 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 it says. It's a different temporality. Yeah. And and it it speaks to the fact that you know this modernity is that doesn't seamlessly integrate with what what is there, nor does it easily transcend um, the let's say the the cultural and social facts on the ground. Yeah, and it's not modernity as a complete break. It's modernity shadowed by led with all these. Uh, um, you know, residues. Whether it's a landscape, whether it's emotional residues that haunt it. Right. Exactly. And also the unfulfilled promises of modernity. It's very right. much there. I mean, Opu doesn't want to be a priest like his father, and which is possibly why I think Shorbuja slaps him, because in a way he's rebuking his father right. or being disdainful of it of him. But um you know, in, in uh, the third film of the trilogy, his dream uh, there is a huge gap between what he had dreamt of and what um, he becomes, right? So Yeah. A okay. writer. Exactly. I think there were a few hands. There's a question over here. We sh- we could go all night, of course, but maybe we should think about wrapping things up. But we'll have a question over here. Thank you all for staying. I'm I'm really <laughs> impressed. That's fairly late. So, hi. <clears throat> From the third part of the trilogy, I remember that a small uh, child is rescued from the train by Apu. Yeah. And I think an animal was killed by the a train. pig, yeah, pig. W- 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 which belonged to the community that that the yes. untouchable community, yes. the community living by the tracks. Yeah. So, with regards to your question, I think um, the train um, changes um, attitude towards the third part of the mm-hmm. trilogy. Yeah. No, thank you for mentioning those. And it also reminded me in the third film, after Opu's wife has died and he goes into, he's in a state of depression, we see him walking along the tracks and he's possibly contemplating suicide and, and the train's approaching, but at the last minute he draws back. So yeah, so the train sort of uh, does change. It's, in its connotations change or its associations change over time. I would like to add something I found very interesting that you were broadening the um, uh, the perception we have from the actor, um, the mother of Apu. Uh, you were highlighting that the actor was also an activist. Mm-hmm. 
And within the film, I found that her acting qualities were not as um, convincing at Apus, for example. And I always saw the activist. Okay, as, tell, as, tell as, me a bit more. Uh, fr okay, I'm... I'm Is not it her gait, her just bearing? Well, what was the... Uh, um, yeah. No, um, watching the, the, the film, I'm, mm, I'm not sure if it was because of your comments or mm -hmm. because of how I am watching um, films that I always saw something else. Mm -hmm. And um, but nonetheless, um, you um, the the various contexts you were um, um, bring hmm? highlighting. highlighting or bringing t uh, to us um, regarding the the uh, various actors in this um, production, mm -hmm. which is a film, um, um, was very interesting um, to me. And I'm not a native speaker, so maybe I should um, stop here and uh, leave it like uh, here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I've always wondered about that. For to me, the way she walks—that's, you know, if if you see, she's very upright, and she has a certain very confident manner of walking, which is very familiar to me from my mother, from other women of a generation who were all on the left. Some of them were activists, others were fellow travelers, and who had, um, who were also among the first, in many of them were the first in their first women in their family to have jobs, to have careers, um, and, uh, you know, have access to higher education. And there was a way they carried themselves, which, um, Again, not stereotyping village women, but uh, I think it's a very particular, uh, it, not even urbane, there's a certain quiet activism there, I think. So, and that always, um, and maybe that, that's why the film resonates with many people like me, uh, many of us, but it also um, makes me wonder about that criticism, with which I don't entirely agree, but there, maybe there's something to it, that there's, um, a lot of urban sophistication in her bearing, not necessarily sophistication, but a certain attitude that comes through that doesn't necessarily um, ring true for that context. Yeah, Amrita. Yeah. I'll try to be as brief as possible, but with response to um, the comment about um, not being very convinced about Corona Banerjee's acting and seeing more of the activist. Uh, she was herself not very convinced with yeah. how she brought out the emotional scene. So Ray and Corona Banerjee would have a lot of dialogue because every time she acted, she was like, I am not very convinced. And I think it's written about a lot, but it's, it's also such a thing about the, the filming procedure of Ray with Karuna that even the latest film that was about filming Pothar Pachali has a sequence um, which is Oporajito mm -hmm. um, by Onik Dotto. Dotto. Onik yeah. mm -hmm. It has a sequence where Karuna is not convinced and Ray is saying, you know, you can do it. And she's like, I can act for the stage and the camera is not really my thing. So there was this struggle within the actor herself. And a short note about the, the management comment which angered Bengali audience. Uh -huh. It was more about the, the, the connection of managing the mother with the money order of two rupees. Yeah. And that was, yeah. And the use of the word manage. Manage, yeah. That uh, an older generation, I think, found it a bit too irreverent when it came to your mother. And also managing with money, you know, like sending managing money is the money. solution, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And also, I mean, uh, it's interesting because Corona Banerjee always say, I mean, said that she, her exper acting experience was for the stage. But then looking back, she also said, I felt that I didn't have the voice for the stage. So uh, my, the cam, you know, the, uh, and I felt that my voice, my style of acting that came most naturally to me was actually better suited to the screen. And apparently she had quite a temper back then. And Shotojit Rai, at least, during the you know making of the first few films was uh, didn't have that 
uh, how do I put it, formidable presence that he later developed. He was quite shy, apparently, and so Gorina Banerjee writes about how she would storm out and, 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 and everyone would just go very quiet and then she would feel repentant and come back later and, and they would then carry on filming. So Ray was also a little kind of tiptoed around her quite a bit, as he did around his mother. Well, maybe we should leave it at that. <laughs> Statuted Ray tiptoeing around his mother. <laughs> Uh, thank you once again to Manishita uh, for thank an excellent you for lecture inviting me. and Thanks. scintillating discussion. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks with Ruche Joshi on the big city. Oh, okay. uh, and a reminder that uh, Cloud Cap Star is preceding that film, so you get to you can go back to back if you want. To oh, what's what's oh uh, Megadeth Cloud Cap? Yeah, oh, yeah. okay. Oh, that would be quite. So, in the program, says Ruche is also introducing that film. Is that correct? Or? Okay, all right, excellent. So, yeah, oh, wonderful. Is there going to be a recording of that? I'm tempted so to come back. Just all, the, for the discussion. all the lectures are going up on YouTube, uh, perfect. So, you can catch up on them as well if you've seen them or missed them. Thank you. Yeah. Oh dear, all my techno fumblings <laughs> would be there for posterity. For posterity, yeah. yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.